Oh, well, I guess it's been seven years, I believe, since we worshipped here, and then I got gone to Coleman to church there, and memories. I keep thinking Royce is supposed to be standing over there. I imagine he's standing in, inside, a, in, inside a place waiting for us. I, uh, I remember I'd come in for breakfast, and my job was to wash the pots and pans. And one day there was some big loot washing my pots and pans. <laughs> Who does he think he is? <laughs> uh, I'll be here next week, and the title will be uh, Under the Influence. Singing that song a while ago, In the Secret, In the Quiet Place, that might have been a better title for this sermon from what I chose. Not too long ago when I sat down to write this sermon, or whatever you call it, it had been a long time since I'd done that. And when Dana saw me dragging out the laptop and asked the title of this one, I told her honestly, I don't know. Ironically, what was stuck in my mind had nothing to do with sermonizing, rather the opposite. A quote from Henry Nowen had been rattling around in my head at a time when I could truly relate. In his book, The Way of the Heart, he makes the point that silence guards the inward fire. Too much verbiage diminishes inspiration. Now, I know you didn't come to church to be terrorized by some off-the-wall pulpit supply guy, but just for a minute, play like you're a preacher. A preacher of some kind. And listen to Henry. Quote, What needs to be guarded is the life of the Spirit within, especially we who want to witness to the presence of God's Spirit in the world need to tend the fire within with utmost care. It is not so strange that many ministers have become burnout cases. People who say many words and share many experiences, but in whom the fire of God's Spirit has died, and from whom not much more comes forth than their own boring, petty ideas and feelings. Sometimes it seems that our many words are more an expression of our doubt than our faith. It's as if we are not sure that God's Spirit can touch the hearts of people. We have to help Him out. And with many words convince others of His power. But it is precisely this wordy unbelief that quenches the fire, says Henry. I thought, how can somebody who has passed away be reading my mind like that? It appears that saying many words on Sunday mornings has been my job. But sometimes I feel like I'm running, running out of them, and it's not altogether a negative feeling. I don't know how long I'll last in this preaching thing. Paul and I were talking about it. Am I supposed to squeeze them out, whether I feel them or not? What happens when I don't feel anything? What do you do like that? So several weeks had passed since I felt inspired to write a sermon, and then I read one little phrase, not even a complete sentence. How could one little subhead have such an impact on, on me? I was reading from Bonhoeffer's little book, Life Together, an exploration of the Christian community. I imagine Doug's been there. It's a classic worth reading, and it's an example of how legitimate art, literature, and music are evocative, as you all know. They evoke, they arouse, they stimulate, or they elicit feelings seemingly unrelated to their purported subject matter. For example, perhaps you've had the experience of reading something truly inspirational in some regard, but it touches you in completely another and why it does so doesn't make sense because the work didn't accomplish in you what the author necessarily intended, but something else entirely. Or perhaps a piece of music somehow reminds you of something important that your heart truly needs to attend. 
I think it's a kind of miracle that the grace of one thing touches the center of grace in you and turns into something else. More than ever after these seven years, I believe that Jesus does his own preaching above, below, and in between the words that are said and heard. May we all do a better job of listening above, below, and in between the words being flung into the air and of hearing him who is the word trying to touch our hearts. Amen. In Bonhoeffer's book, Chapter 4, Ministry, I was sort of skimming along, searching maybe like a blind hog looking for an acorn, when this subheading jumped out at me. Quote, The ministry of holding one's tongue. Well, Well, shut my mouth. (laughs) Who would ever think of that as a ministry? And how I wish on several levels that I could do that. If that is ministry, what else that we hardly recognize also ministers? And so another sermon began, for better or for worse. Bonhoeffer began that section by saying, Often we combat our evil thoughts most effectively if we absolutely refuse to allow them to be expressed in words. It is certain that the spirit of self-justification can be overcome only by the spirit, that's capital S, the spirit of grace. Nevertheless, Isolated thoughts of judgment can be curbed and smothered by never allowing them the right to be uttered, except as confession of sin, of course. End quote. She who holds her tongue in check can control both the mind and body. That's scripture. And that's just how we're made. If we battle any problem in life by dedicating ourselves to silence, we gain strength in that fight. So being able to hold my tongue becomes a ministry when I cease to give expression of having scrutinized, judged, and condemned a man for his personality or his behavior. I begin to see him then as a completely free person, as God made him to be, and ironically he becomes a joy to me. Have you experienced that? I should never suppose how God's image should appear in others. That image has a uniqueness that comes solely from his creator. Can you stand silence for very long? Could you live without the constant bombardment of words and noise in your life? The spirit of the word of God, he who is heaven's communication to the world, arrives out of eternal silence. And to this grace of silence, we want to live as witnesses. Many of our spiritual mothers and fathers have said, I know Doug's talked about them a lot, because he preaches it to me too, have said that silence makes us pilgrims and serves as the best anticipation of the future world. It makes us ready and willing. Consider now in thesis that silence guards the fire within, An ability to stay quiet protects the power of faith, the heat from the Holy Spirit dwelling within, the religious emotions which improve our hearts. Quote, Our first and foremost task is faithfully to care for that inward fire so that when it is really needed, it can offer warmth and light to lost travelers. End quote. Too often we allow the holy burning our, our zeal, to die down by endlessly discussing matters of the world, blah, 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 and even matters of the church, yada, yada, yada. In some prolonged conversation, when we've already said it before and we know we'll never change so-and-so's mind, why do we keep talking? Are we that insecure? Save the power of the word in your heart for a time when it can have spiritual influence. Trust that God will, by divine appointment, bring about such a time. Excuse me. 
that Dutch painter Vincent van Gogh expressed this conviction. There may be a great fire in our soul, yet no one ever comes to warm himself at it. And the passers-by only see a wisp of smoke coming through the chimney and go along their way. Look here. Now what must be done? Must one tend the inner fire? Wait patiently with how much impatience for the hour when someone will come and sit down? Maybe to stay? Let him who believes in God wait for the hour that will come sooner or later. End quote. I tried to read that plain like I had one ear. It didn't work out well. <laughs> all right, we are all ministers here, in spite of what it says on the front of bulletins. And the greatest temptation of us all makes us talk too much. This weakens our faith and makes us lukewarm. However, blessed silence is a sacred discipline, a guardian of the Spirit's power, waiting to be released at the right time for His sake. You see, it's silence that teaches us how to speak in our own way and in His way. Set yourself apart from this babbling, long-winded world by developing an appetite for wordlessness. Love can grow then. And so silence teaches us how and when to speak. When the silence from which the word comes forth is not born of emptiness and absence, but of fullness and nearness, not the terribly human silence of embarrassment or shame, but that of a commitment to love, the mysteries of the Lord go to work. Then he can speak. One of the desert fathers, Isaac of Nineveh, said, If you love truth, be a lover of silence. May our words be carefully chosen and may they be few. Silence is the mystery of the world to come. It keeps us traveling and prevents us from becoming entangled in the cares of the age, as Ronnie referred. Paradoxically, by grace, silence allows us to speak in ways that participate in the creative and the recreative power of the word of God that spoke the world into into being and then became flesh to dwelt among us. To be silent is to be godlike. It may be that uh, the deepest form of prayer begins when we run out of things to say. When our minds finally empty and our hearts finally open to God's presence and His will. Be silent before the Lord, wrote Zephaniah. And just as attentive silence makes relationship with God possible, it is necessary in all healthy relationships. Are you a careful listener? Can you keep your own words out of your mind when she is talking? Or must you be forming your response while she speaks? I guess we've all witnessed or participated in one of those sad scenes when two people talk at each other simultaneously sort of like a shootout, without either listening or allowing the other to complete a thought. Only when partners in dialogue listen wholeheartedly and willingly become silent in turn can communication occur. And that willingness is the denial of self that Jesus spoke about. Moving into deep spiritual communion with another which is what he put us here for, calls for patience, sacrifice, and humility. When you know meaningful dialogue with another is imminent, pray for discernment and a quiet spirit. In a deep conversation, after the other has finished speaking, allow a few seconds to elapse if you think you need to respond. 
Not only then will a quiet frame of mind lead us toward our maker and our best selves, it improves our relationship with each other. We must have the ability to banish the various forms of noise in our lives so that the Lord can educate us. Listening lovingly sharpens our understanding, stirs our compassion, and empowers us to care truly for others. Now Doug would like this part. Periods of retreat for the purpose of quietude. Rings a bell? <laughs> or even a, fast, even a fast from unnecessary speech instead of from food can become world-changing for us. And I know I'm speaking to the choir here in lots of cases. Spiritual retreats are not escapist and selfish. They are not a flight from the world. Rather, they serve as a preparation to serve the world. Thomas Merton said that retreats liberates us from, quote, the constant din of empty words and machine noises, the endless booming of loudspeakers that make communication and true communion almost impossible, end quote. So easily we become contaminated by our wordy world that we cling to the deception of the evil one that our words are more important than our silence. And we get so addicted to noise. We feel self-conscious without it, and we suffer withdrawal symptoms. Do simple things that help break the addiction. At least mute the television during the ball game. Yeah, a cowboy game. Doug wouldn't like that part. <laughs> Wear earplugs around for no particular reason except one. Learn to love soundlessness and serenity and pray to discover the secret of how to think more with your heart instead of your mind. After a literal or at least a figurative retreat into silence and solitude, God gives a new freedom to be with people, a sensitivity which blesses others. We discover a fresh ability of attentive, attentiveness to their needs and responsiveness to their hurts. Reminds me of what you said about your daddy, Paula. Thomas Merton again. It is in deep solitude that I find the gentleness with which I can truly love my brothers. He was Catholic. The more solitary I am, the more affection I have for them. Solitude and silence teach me to love brothers for what they are, not for what they say. To live as a minister of Jesus, our lives must point beyond our words to His unspeakable mystery. And quiet time alone with Him teaches us how. End quote. If we can sing, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, I want to see you, then we can also sing, unplug the ears of my heart, Lord, I want to hear you. But for either of those to happen, you have to cherish silence. If we can live by faith and not by sight, if we can believe in the unseen, then we can also listen for an unspoken word that comes in loud and clear. Brother James Hallmark used to go here when he was under in his big operation. He said, when, when the Lord spoke to me, it was not with words, but it was the clearest communication of my whole life. I'll never forget that. Carry quietness around with you. Do not be intimidated by silence. Communicate more with your eyes, your countenance, and your body language, and your spirit. Experiment by doing deeds without any words of explanation to anyone. Don't ask so many questions. Just watch and listen. Contrive times and places for wordlessness. In them the Lord reorients your life like a compass needle. He helps you to taste the grace of the present, preparing you for whom and what he has just around the corner. 
<clears throat> After a long absence, have you ever missed someone so badly it hurt? And when feeling that way, have you ever thought something like, I really don't have a lot to say to her, and I don't need to hear the sound of her voice, because I remember it well enough. I wouldn't even have to hold her, because my memory served me well. I just want to be in the same room alone with her again, to see that look on her smiling face that says she still loves me. And I want to smile back in the same way. Have you? Well, the Lord misses you like that. He tries to reach you through all the hullabaloo. And the day hasn't arrived yet when He will shout all of it away. Someday the world will shut up. Until then, He waits for you in the blessed silence. God bless you.